verse 6 says this. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Do you notice that? You notice how that they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit. How did they know that? Did God appear to them or were they praying? Were they seeking the face of the Lord? Were they, were they wanting to know what God's will was about where they should be ministering the word? I'm afraid we get away from that, but I think that's very important today. So very, very important that you are where God wants you to be and you're doing what God wants you to be doing. I just got this email on Monday, uh, 18 March 2019. Now this is just a part. This is a long email. This is just part of it. But this lady sent this and this just came out of, the, out of the blue and here's what she said. She said, and this, let me give you a little background. She has, she's a nurse, been around death, a lot of death, a lot of death in hospice and, uh, and things of that nature. And she has seen a lot of suffering and she has been through a lot herself, through depression and all kinds of problems. And you know, folks, when you're around dying people, it can really have an effect on you. And this is what she was around for a long time. And, uh, and it really began to get her down. And she was with her husband. And um, I'll pick it up here. On Monday, the 18th of March, 2019, I was headed up to the hospital to get some lab work done. I was in a panic before I had even walked out the door. Once at the hospital, it was made worse by that feeling of claustrophobia. I mean, really, why do these rooms have to be so small? That's what claustrophobia is, closed in. On the way home, my husband and I picked up the conversation we'd started before walking into the hospital. And then, boom, smack, stop the car. In that intense, insane, driving down the road moment, God showed me that I was living in darkness. I mean, how much more darkness is there than death? How much more hopelessness must there be for all of those who committed suicide? I surrendered. I gave it to God. I jubilantly laughed in peace and in calm. Every thought that I had held that didn't speak life to me, I laid at the foot of the cross. I pray God give me knowledge and comprehension. He gave me your church. God's using Temple Baptist Church. Don't let anybody put you down. God is using this church. He's using this church in a mighty way. And I thank God for it. Acts chapter number 1, verses 7 through 8. He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both, now watch this, in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Notice how it works here. He wants them to be witnesses. Now contrast that with back when he sent the twelve out and said, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, but go on into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Obviously, something has changed. This is one of the ways you study the Bible. It's a very important way to study the Bible. Something has changed. They're not the same. Why is it in one place the Lord says, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? But on the other hand, he tells them, I want you to go in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then out into the Gentile world, as far as to the ends of the earth. Something has changed. And there's a lot of things that you can learn to help you study the Bible. And the progressive revelation is one of the greatest ways of studying the Word of God. And the only way that this can fit together and make sense is what we call dispensationalism. Something obviously has changed. But notice he said Jerusalem, Acts chapter number 2, verse 14. The Bible said, Peter, standing up with eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. And then what follows, of course, is the great day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit had fallen upon the believers. And when he fell upon them, it uh, got the attention of an awful lot of people. And, of course, he had started in Jerusalem. 
And that's, all, that's appropriate because Jerusalem is Mount Moriah, folks. It's where God put his name. It's where it all came from. It all started in Jerusalem. It's the city of the great king. It's the holy mountain of God. Jerusalem is the place where he meets with man at the cross at Calvary. So start at Jerusalem. Now, where is our Jerusalem? Obviously, it's Knoxville, Tennessee. It may be St. Louis, Missouri. We had some people here Sunday from St. Louis. We've had people here from Lexington and Louisville, Kentucky. We've had people here from all over, people from Atlanta. Whatever your Jerusalem is, that's where we start and send out the word of God, not us, the word of the living God. You're begotten by the word. You're not begotten by the pastor. You're begotten by the word. Then he said Judea, Acts 5 verse 16, the Bible said, There came also a multitude out of the cities, round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Notice, out of the cities, round about Jerusalem. That, of course, is Judea, because Jerusalem is located in the southern part of Israel, which is Judea. You know how the land was divided. You have the northern part, which was capital was Samaria. The southern part, the capital was Judea, was Jerusalem. The northern part is referred to generally as Israel in the Old Testament. The southern as Judea. So Jerusalem is in the capital of Judea, and it's in the middle of Judea. And there, all around, was their Judea. So where is our Judea? Well, our Judea spreads out from where we are tonight. We get the word of God out. We want to get it out. We want to disseminate the word of God. That simply means to get it out, folks. Put it, in, put it before the people. Man, you wouldn't believe. I get so much, so many emails where they're saying, Preacher, preacher, preacher. Our preachers won't preach anything. They won't preach anything. All we get is prosperity, prosperity, prosperity. And you're the most wonderful thing in the world. And you're so beautiful. <laughs> Won't you get sick of hearing that? <laughs> how, many of you, how many of you take a good long look in the mirror when you get up every day? <laughs> you know, I'm not talking about your physical looks. That's vanity. I'm talking about you look in that mirror and there's a spirit looking into that mirror through these eyes right here. And, you, and by all means, be honest with yourself. Who are you? Are you a real believer? Then the Bible said Samaria. Acts chapter 8 verse 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria. And preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And I've heard, I'm sure you've heard many messages about this. Where there was a great revival in Samaria. And there was. But God called Philip out of all of that to go down to Gaza to one lone man. He was an Ethiopian eunuch under, uh, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. And when he went down there, he, he went down to him and, he, and he, uh, he ministered to him. Look at Acts chapter number 8, verse 26. Now let's look at this. The angel of the Lord spake to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, or Gaza which is desert, and believe me, it is. And he arose and went, behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah, or Esaias the prophet, then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to his chariot, and Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? He said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. God was working on both sides. He's working with the man reading the book of Isaiah, because you read the book of the word of God, Isaiah is the book, and it'll bring light. The entrance of thy word bringeth light, bringeth understanding, and it will also bring conviction. This man is exactly like Apollo, later on in the book of Acts, where Apollos knew only the baptism of John. And Priscilla and Aquila went to him and began to preach to him the word of God more fully. There wasn't anything wrong with what Apollos believed, but dispensationally he was in the back. See, 
And so he needed to be brought up to what Christ had done and who he was. Same here. This man is reading Isaiah. Is there anything wrong with Isaiah? <laughs> of course not. He's reading the word of God. No problem at all. And it shows you that he was a believer in the word of God. Because he readily accepted the apostle when he came down and began to preach Christ to him. So he prepared the man to receive the word and he prepared the man to give the word. Salvation is of the Lord and he's working on both sides and the man gets saved. And he's baptized out there. Makes you wonder where they find the water. <laughs> because it's a desert land. But he's baptized. And uh, this is the... Uh, this is, the, this is this goes over and over again in the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts, if there's anything in Acts, it's about evangelism. It's about winning people to the Lord. It's about the work of the Holy Spirit revealing His will and His word, His person. And if you'll notice all through the book of Acts, it's Christ and Him crucified that they preach. And beginning at the scripture, they preach Jesus to Him. The Lord Jesus Christ is all over the Bible. He is the Word of God. He's the living Word of God. I want you to notice in Acts chapter number 13, verse 1, it says this. There were in the church that was at Antioch. Now notice carefully. Antioch is in Syria. And Antioch becomes the very foundational church of the missionary work. Not Jerusalem, Antioch. Outside of Jerusalem, Antioch of Syria. The scripture says there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with, un, up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. That's the uttermost parts of the earth. Going out. The Apostle Paul made three missionary journeys as he carried the word of God out. Paul was a church builder. He would establish a church, then go back and check on it later to see how it's doing. We've had that here. We've had missionaries come through here that are church planters. They've planted churches all over the world, and then they go back and they check on them to see how they're doing. So this is what's going on here. Churches, and that's the greatest thing you can do, folks. You can't do anything better than to plant a church. If you get a church, if you get the church of God planted wherever you are, then you've got indigenous preachers, indigenous, indigenous ministers. That simply means of that area. And they're there preaching and they're there teaching and they're there living with the people and they're getting the word of God out. So they go to the uttermost part of the earth. Acts 28. Now watch this carefully. Acts 28 verse 23. <laughs> and when they appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. You remember, the Jews, Old Testament, the Tanakh, is broken down into three basic divisions. The law, the prophets, and the writings. This is what he does. All through the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Let them you think you have eternal life. Look at all these people that are saved and not a word of New Testament has been written. Isn't that amazing? They're all saved out of the Old Testament. Can you, can you lead somebody to the Lord out of the Old Testament? Absolutely. No question about it. You take Isaiah chapter number 53 and open it up and you can get people saved from it. You certainly can. So the scripture says here that uh, from the law and the prophets, and some believed, verse 24, the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias the prophet unto our fathers. And of course he quotes the Old Testament saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and should be converted and I should heal them. 
Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Had the word of God been preached to the Gentiles before this? Of course it had. But you see what happens here. This is a judicial declaration. This is a declaration of a dispensation. This is saying, Jews, we're done with you. Now we're going to the Gentiles. The focus of evangelism will be toward the Gentiles. The Jew has his Talmud. He has his Zohar. And he has his oral tradition. The Kairite Jew, to his credit, to his great credit, the Kairite Jew rejects the Talmud. He rejects the Zohar. He sticks with the Tanakh, the Old Testament. That's to his credit. The Samaritans on Mount Gerizim in the northern, northern part of Israel, Samaria, they have, a, they have a Pentateuch, which is ancient. We're talking, about, we're talking about back to the time of Moses, practically. 3,400 years old. This Pentateuch, this Pentateuch agrees, essentially, with the Pentateuch of the Jew. There are some differences. But it shows you, when you look at something like that, how true to the Word of God it is. The Zohar is the foundation for the Kabbalah. Kabbalah is mysticism. It is the mixture of, with, of um, Judaism with the, the occult of the world. That's essentially what it is, the Kabbalah. Here's what they're left with. He prophesied in the book of Hosea that they would go many years without a sacrifice, no temple, no priesthood, none of that. And that's exactly where they are now. But right now, there is a real effort to build the third temple. And they don't go too public with it because it's an uproar for the Muslims. But if they're going to build the third temple, if they do get it built, then it's going to be a fulfillment of prophecy. For the Bible tells you plainly in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, that he will sit in the temple of God, professing himself to be God. The Antichrist. In order for the Antichrist to sit in a temple, there must be a temple there. So once they had rejected the word of God, they had rejected the preaching of Paul, then they're left to the sparks that they can create themselves. And there's no more leading of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what happens. You tonight have been blessed with the Holy Spirit. He is our guide. He said when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. Won't speak of himself. Now here's what, listen. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he also speak. The Holy Spirit is listening to the voice of God. And he's conveying that to the church. The church is the, it, it is the actual body of of the Son of God on this earth. And there's nothing on this earth that's greater than his bride, Amen. his church. Acts 1.8 Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Power that we need desperately. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. Now the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 16 verse 14, A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, a city of Thyatira, being a seller of purple, she sold to the monarchy, to the royal blood, because purple is what they wore, which worshipped God, heard us, now watch this, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. I mean, folks, you have people who come to church and they sit, they, they, they'll sit here and sleep. But they are as dead to the truth. They have no desire for anything spiritual. None. You might as well preach to that wall. There's got to be something moving and stirring inside the soul. 
Don't pass that off and say, well, maybe tomorrow, or maybe tomorrow, or maybe tomorrow. If the Holy Ghost moves within your soul, He's moving in your soul to draw you to Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.12 Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Now what's this mean? Well, no, you look at, look at Acts. They killed James with a sword. Right? A man comes in and says, when the apostle Paul was determined to go east, the man shows up and he was from Macedonia. He said, come over and help us. It's called a Macedonian vision. Where's Macedonia? That's the homeland of Philip. Who's Philip? Philip was the father of Alexander the Great. In other words, we're going back. We're going back to the heart of civilization of that time. Come back. Come to Macedonia and preach the gospel. Now, the Lord opens one door. He may shut another. But God's got to open the door. We used to go out here and go from house to house to house. I have knocked on, I don't know how many doors. We have knocked doors down. We have knocked on doors. People won't even come to the door today. You know why? They're afraid. They're afraid. We live in perilous times. So what do you do? You look for another avenue of evangelism. How do you reach them? Well, God's using this. He's using the internet. And uses television, radio, missionary work, like these folks here do down in Haiti. He uses all kinds of different ways to get God's word out. In 1941, 42, I think it was 42, Adolf Hitler invaded Russia with three million troops. You talk about an army, that's an army. Operation Barbarossa. He was going to go in and he was going to take uh, these, uh, uh, what do you call them, Slavs, Slavics, the Slavic. He was going to take the Slavic country. The word Slav, the Slavic, the word Slav comes from slave. Hitler was very, very big on race and stature. And so therefore he felt like the Slavs of Russia were definitely underneath the Ar Ar Aryan, Aryan, uh, Aryan race of the Germans. So what happened? Well, he butts, head with, he butts heads with Stalin. These are two names that everybody knows, probably. You've heard of Adolf Hitler. You've heard of Joseph Stalin. Let me tell you something tonight you might not have heard about them. Tens of millions of people died on this earth because of Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. You all know that, don't you? Tens of millions. Lord only knows. Some people say that Stalin is responsible for 50 million people in the Soviet Union alone. And when you get into the Ukraine, that he literally starved millions of the Ukrainians to death. This is why there is such hatred among the Ukrainians for the Russians. This is why there's such a stickling thing with the Crimea. When Russia moved in there and took the sovereignty of the Crimea, which is in the tip of the Ukraine, it's been a hot point, flash point, all right? This stuff goes back for decades. But let me read something for you tonight about Mr. Stalin. This is quoted in Newsweek. Svetlana Stalin, this is his daughter, describes her father's death. We quote, my father died a difficult and terrible death. God grants an easy death only to the just. At what seemed the very last moment, he suddenly opened his eyes and cast a glance over everyone in the room. It was a terrible glance, insane or perhaps angry and full of fear of death. The tyrant that had killed so many it's like Bundy. It's like Ted Bundy. When they got ready to fry him for all those people that he had killed, he was full of fear. Full of it. Full of fear. 
So he lifted his left hand as though he were pointing to something above and bringing down a curse on us all. The jester was full of menace. The next moment, the spirit wrenched itself free of the flesh. This is by his daughter. He had one daughter, two sons. And obviously, she's a witness to his death. Joseph Stalin, whose real name was, it's hard to pronounce this. This is, this is definitely a foreign language. But anyway, he was born and raised in Gory in what is now the nation of Georgia. He died of a cerebral hemorrhage in 1953. He was raised very religious in the Greek Orthodox Church. He was named after St. Joseph and was raised to be a priest. His father was a priest, and young Joseph spent five years in a Greek Orthodox seminary. Stalin's father beat him mercilessly, and Stalin once described his childhood as having been raised in a poor priest-ridden household. Perhaps this contributed to his decision to become a Marxist revolutionary. In plain words, he's saying that if my dad could deep could, could beat me like this, I don't want any part of his Christianity. Who knows? But here's the bottom line. He went a long way from going to a seminary and becoming the monster that he became. What if he had really gotten saved? What if Joseph, St Joseph Stalin had really become a Christian? It might have changed everything, World War II. Now let's, Mr. Hitler. He studied at Lambach Abbey, a Benedictine monastery, around 1897. He used, there he used to be a choir boy and was deeply impressed by the monks. So he wanted to become a monk. His mother Clara was a devout Catholic and agreed that Hitler should become a monk. He used to go into the kitchen, put an apron over his shoulders, and fantasized himself to be a priest, and delivered long sermons to the imaginary flock in that empty kitchen. That monastery is still there in Lambach, Austria. Two men with a religious background, both of these men were raised up on the appearance of a Christian home, Lord only knows how much, you know, real faith these people had. But they were definitely exposed to a form of Christianity. Yet Hitler became the monster in Germany, responsible for tens of millions. And Stalin became the monster of the Soviet Union, responsible for the death of tens of millions. Two monsters met, and of course, and a lot of issues were involved, but they blamed most of it on the weather. The cold Russian winter and the troops weren't prepared for it. Uh, same thing happened to Napoleon when he took his troops in there, and it caused them to have to cause them to be defeated. You know how important it is for a soul to be saved. Do you realize tonight that if you if the Lord's moving in your heart and He's He's touching you, He's speaking to you, won't you do something about it? Because you never know what is liable, what what's liable to come of your life. Really, you don't know. You don't know. We don't know what's going to become of our life. I know Hitler and I know Stalin. I know what happened to them. That's sad, isn't it? A cerebral hemorrhage, 1953, and he dies. But what, right as he's dying, this terrible fear is in his eyes. Could it be that he was seeing something that the rest of them couldn't see? It is a fearful thing fall into the hands of the living God. It is, folks. It's a fearful. You can run from men. You can't run from God. Father, bless your word tonight. Thank you for the opportunity we've had to meet, to talk about evangelism, the book of Acts, talk about the life of Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, what it means, how we apply these truths we've learned about them, how we can apply them to ourselves. Father, I pray that everybody in this house tonight is saved. I pray they know you, and I pray they love you. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that they have that assurance in their heart and in their soul that they're born again. I thank you for that, Father. But there may be some in here tonight who aren't. They don't have that. They're unsure. They're uncertain. They're still filled with uh, 
with, 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 with uh, darkness, filled with <laughs> the world. There's no light in their soul. They're grasping, they're clawing and fighting to try to, try to find the truth. Lord, make it simple to them. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one the Holy Ghost will lead them to. He'll lead them straight to the Son of God. He will not lead them to what they've done. He will not lead them to what they, what they, what they might have tried in the past. He will lead them to Christ. I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake I ask you.